let's reel it in. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to episode whatever this is of the Luke Wiki Podcast. 21, episode 21. Sorry, they got out of order. Uh, I'm your host, Carl Meisterheim. With me always is Taylor Page. This is the podcast where we talk about Shopify development, Shopify developers, and all things that are interesting to us, which may not be interesting to you, but hopefully it is. And today, we're very excited to have our special guest, Coralie, with us. Coralie is a longtime Shopify freelancer and recently and now a technical architect on the performance team at Shopify. So she is official with us here to talk about all kinds of exciting Shopify things today. So welcome, Coralie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Of yeah. course. Thank you for coming. Oh, crap. This is where I should insert some kind of witty French phrase, but I'll save that for the end if you see my pick. So <laughs> we'll get there. But welcome to the show. And uh, we always like to kick things off here with a little like, how's your week? What's going on? So uh, Taylor, why don't you go? And then I'll have Coralie go. Then I'll go. And then we'll jump into the meat. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so as far as what's been going on for me personally, just continuing to work with a handful of clients uh, that we are doing some fun stuff with checkout extensions, which I hope we get to talk about today. Uh, because, you know, obviously, there's always things to learn in this right now, while it's still like really new. Uh, and then working, there's a lot of like, that I'm, I'm dealing with lately with integrating with apps specifically so things like you know these larger app systems like yapo um, where the app only goes so far but we need to do something relatively custom for a shopify plus shop and so it's nice that they have an api but then figuring out what's the best way for us to fold that in uh, with what we're doing already in the theme and then uh, i'm still working on as well a a new theme uh, redesign on this a vintage Shopify theme, which people are always really surprised. Yes, there's lots of like non 2.0 stores still running out there. Uh, lots of very big non 2.0 stores because they maybe spent a lot of money on a very custom theme. And so now having to make that transition is is a bit of an overhaul. And so, um, you know, working on getting that updated to a 2.0 theme uh, and I'm using meta objects extensively there. So very exciting for that. And then kind of personal project kind of type stuff as well. Um, this new thing uh, that I was, I've been, you know, posting about as well, the shop dev Alliance, a freelance Shopify Slack uh, community as well. So um, just starting to send out emails for that, you know, that's probably taking up too much of my time this week. <laughs> I probably need to like balance that back towards client work. Um, but that's, that's primarily what I've been doing uh, that enjoying some nice sunshine finally here in Ohio. So no, I still haven't gotten that invite in my email box. I'll, I'll check again, but. Uh, oh yeah. It's, I mean, it's pretty exclusive, Carl. It, so. Is it? Okay. Well, <laughs> anyway, thanks. Coralie, how about you? What do you want to do this week? Uh, this week uh, was week seven for me at Shopify, so starting to get on my first projects, uh, continuing to meet people as well. I'm trying to meet people uh, in my team, of course, but also in other teams. Um, I've discovered uh, topics I didn't know that Shopify had. Um, so trying to meet people in Canada, in the US, and also in Europe. And yeah, the first call with my first clients, maybe we'll talk. Uh, be more about the job later, but that was my main thing. And on the side, um, I've been playing with Checkout UI extension this week uh, at night, um, and it's it's pretty fun. I've done also first um, extension only app with a Shopify function, uh, which was very cool as well. So yeah, trying to play with the latest tools these days. Nice one. It's your job to stay up to date with stuff too. It's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. And did a couple of GitHub repos. So we were sharing that. We'll make sure that that's in the notes for everybody too. Cool. Well, since everybody asked what I've been up to, I'll share too. So uh, I've been uh, doing work on Shopify checkout extensions as well. Uh, whereas, I don't know. I'm sure you guys are all way more advanced with these than I am, but I feel like I constantly stumble through a lot of stuff. In particular, this one oriented around the checkout branding API. And I was bashing mm. my head. And I, Lamented at length about that in the previous episode, which I'm presuming will go up for this one. But who knows? Yes. It will. Okay. So if you listen to that, I won't belabor that again. But uh, the other thing we've been doing this week is the weather finally turned nice. And so I've been taking my kids on bike rides. And so we're like in this place of where they're old enough now we can like leave the neighborhood and cross some busy roads, to, like get to other parts of the city. And like, whoa, we, we, we can ride our bike here like to the library, to the park. You know, we don't normally that kind of stuff. So that's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Very cool. All right. Well, enough of the jibber jabber. We're here to get 
to the root of what's going on with Corley. Corley, if you've listened to the podcast, which you claim to have done, which I don't believe because no one suffers to that unnecessarily. Yeah. No, no, I haven't. Yes, okay. Uh, you like probably know I like to start every episode with what I like to call like an origin story. If you're a fan of comics or Marvel movies, it's a very common thing. But, uh, you know, people are curious, like, how did you start? in the industry as a developer and specifically how did you get into the Shopify ecosystem? And then clearly you have an even more exciting chapter in terms of working as Taylor put it for the mothership. So share with us, how did you get going all this? Um, initially I was, if you really want the origin, origin, initially I was in, in law school. I was a law student, uh, in France. Uh, I did four right. years of law school. After that, I went to business school for a master in management because I was very interested in, uh, entrepreneurship. At the time, still uh, today, but at the time, uh, very, very much, I was watching interviews of entrepreneurs uh, all the time on YouTube. Um, and basically what I thought was that um, it would be nice if I if I learned how to code, like to create my own projects, my own websites. So I did a coding bootcamp uh, after the business school. So coding bootcamp called Low Wagon, uh, maybe, you know, um, I don't know how widespread they are in the US. I know they're in Canada, uh, but mainly uh, in Europe. They're also in South America. They're a bit of everywhere. Uh, it's basically a nine weeks coding bootcamp around Ruby on Rails and JavaScript. So I did that. Um, it was the beginning of uh, 2019. Um, and after that, I started as a freelance. I thought that's the perfect mix uh, of what I wanted to do is create my own company, but also being able to move because um, I wanted to discover a bit more of Europe uh, and not just France. France is nice, but I wanted to go to Spain, to, Spain, to Portugal, to yeah, other countries. Um, so I became a freelance, but first it was uh, freelancing around uh, Ruby on Rails, which was a technology that we learned at Le Wagon, uh, and also a bit of WordPress because I had a blog um, a few years back, so I knew a bit of WordPress. So I've done one or two uh, freelance gigs um, in that area. And then one day I just got contacted online by someone who wanted a Shopify store. Uh, it was a guy working in the cinema industry and he told me uh, my wife is creating hair care products uh, at home and she would like to sell them online. So would you be able to help her create the Shopify store? Uh, he said there shouldn't be m much coding involved, just helping her choose a theme and then customize it, basically help her uh, just put the site live. Um, and he said, uh, could you come to our house uh, to show us, like physically, not in a call or not just on your side, and then you deliver, like, can you come uh, for a whole day? And I, ne I never touched uh, Shopify before that. I just saw, like, I think advertising around dropshipping. I had a very vague idea of what Shopify was. So I had to really, really study it before coming to his house, uh, obviously. So I, I created a development store and I tried to like experiment uh, a bit. And then I went to their house. We built a store. It went well. Uh, they were, like, a bit behind me, you know, over my shoulder <laughs> looking at what I was doing. <laughs> it was wow. fun. Yeah, so that was my first uh, mission with Shopify. And because I really, really enjoyed it, uh, I then kind of marketed myself as a freelance Shopify developer, both on LinkedIn and also on the freelance platforms to hopefully get more uh, missions in that area, uh, which I did. So yeah, only had Shopify projects after that uh, for five years and then joined Shopify uh, at the beginning of the year. That is quite the story, yeah. No, I could tell her is, something is about it? her I liked. The Rails background. I knew it. See, I, gonna, I just picked I knew up on you were going to say something about that. Like, I just, you always watch like Carl's eyes line up when someone starts talking about Ruby <laughs> or Rails. Like, that's, really? So is, is, it, is it common for people to, like, if someone asked me as, as a freelance dev, like, can you come to my house and show me how to do this? I'd be like, no. That's in the U.S. I'd be like, no. Is that normal over there? Or was it, was it still an uncommon request you just did because you were trying to... You're trying to get jobs, right? Yeah, I was really trying to get jobs. No, it was the only time I was asked that, honestly. <laughs> I never had the same request afterwards. And yeah, I, to be honest, I wasn't 100% like reassured when I went there. I was like, okay, I told my friends, they were like, you're crazy. Like, you're going to some stranger's house to build a website with the technology the you don't thing. know. I would told you the same thing. I'd be like, do not go. No. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it went perfectly fine. We had a lot well, of fun. Good. Yeah. No, oh, that's yeah. I was really curious if that's a normal thing or if that's just no, a US thing where we would be like, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, I, I had a friend that worked for UPS. Quick side story here. 
but he was all he was a very friendly fellow and kind of the same thing he told us this one time about he was delivering a package and some guy wanted to invite him down to his basement in order to Ooh, see gosh. some kind of collection and he he was like yeah i went down there and just you know i was like what are you are you insane <laughs> you know, like this is the beginning of like every horror serial killer movie man and so he was like oh he was an older guy i'd, I'd have been fine i was like you didn't know what was down in the basement <laughs> so that's i'm glad it worked out well for you too uh that you're you're here with us and that not only that, like it helped kind of launch uh, you continuing to work in Shopify. So you also skipped over yeah. a little bit of a part two. I know it was like a, maybe a smaller part, but you also worked uh, with Clean Canvas for a while, a theme, yeah, a yeah. theme shop. So you, yeah, yeah. you did that. What was your role there? What were, what were you doing there? I, <laughs> okay. I do my homework, Carl. That's that's. <laughs> Don't go to Taylor's basement, whatever you do. <laughs> yeah, yes, <yeah>, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Well, at, at first, um, it was still part of the freelance journey. Like, basically, when I started, it yeah. was um, Shopify store creation. So it was mainly uh, first-time entrepreneurs who just left their job and, like, go full-time on their first project. So I've done that mm -hmm. for, I think, the six first months of my activity. And then yeah. after, uh, it was more about migrating stores. I had a lot of migrations from platforms such as WooCommerce or PrestaShop uh, or Squarespace onto Shopify. So I did that for a while. After that, I had more of a long-term mission. So I did like two days per week uh, for a French mm -hmm. brand called Balzac Paris. I also worked for another one called Respire, which is what it was uh, one day per week. So more of a long-term and um, usually we had lot of, lots of stuff to set up like POS or mm -hmm. they were starting to go internationally or stuff like that. But as a lot of freelance, I kind of took too many missions at the same time. There was a part where I wasn't sleeping so much. I didn't take vacation oh, in a long yeah. time. Uh, it was a bit rough for me. So at that point, I was like, um, it would be cool if I was working on the same topic, uh, whether still freelance or in a full-time job. I didn't really mind, but uh, just on one topic. And so that's when um, I, I went to Clean Canvas. I had met Marcus a few months back at the Shopify Unite in London. I think it was yeah. 2022. Uh -huh. uh, if I remember correctly. And so when I was a bit fed up with the freelance thing, then uh, we just got to chat. Um, and so I worked with Clean Canvas for a year and it was really fun. So my job was just uh, basically theme developer. So I was working mm -hmm. on the new theme that we had at the time, which was enterprise. Uh, yeah. When I arrived, I think it was like a bit more than half built. So I just hump on and uh, help the, the other developers just get it finished, basically. Um, I worked especially on the... Um, on the custom JavaScript events that we had on the theme. It was really cool to, to set nice. up. Um, I, and we I also love it when themes do that. Things. It makes it so handy. And I'm sure as a yeah, freelancer, yeah. you had a lot of firsthand experience of like how helpful it was using that where you're trying to extend a theme. And you're like, oh, like these custom events that are here, this is perfect because this is everything that I need. It's already built in. So that's, yeah, that's exactly. awesome that you had you had that experience. What what yeah. was it like for you? I mean, so you you made that where you were freelancing for a good long while. And then made this transition and it must have gone really well with clean canvas because also then you you know you hop shipped to shopify we haven't haven't really done as much um with freelancing so, but was that hard for you to give up freelancing to go work you know work for somebody else like that um no honestly i was happy just <laughs> i was happy just giving freelancing um yeah. i feel like i left freelancing when i joined clean canvas because even though i was freelance on paper uh, i was with the team uh, full-time with them so right. um, it, i wasn't sad leaving freelancing uh i was happy i finally like started having limits you know at my work like at six or whatever yes. the day is finished i'm not gonna think about it in my bed or something like that i have real weekends for once and just also just being part of a team because usually with my clients I was part of a team in the sense that I was talking with a designer a marketer a head of e-commerce but I didn't have other developers with me um and and not senior ones as well and at Clean Canvas yeah. I had all of that so and they all have like so much experience they've been around for more than 10 years so for me it was great learning experience right yeah, that's amazing. No, that sounds like it was a fantastic opportunity. It came at the right time. So I'm, I'm yeah. glad that you got to do that. That's awesome. And then and then you hop from there to Shopify. So that's awesome. that's even better. Yeah. So it's it's kind of their fault because like at Clean Canvas, one third of the team is previous Shopify. So you yep. get to talk with them and they're like, Oh, that sounds so interesting. I'll keep an eye open. <laughs> I was yeah. gonna ask if that had always been an ambition, you know, in, to get to Shopify, or was it more as you're in that clean canvas environment interacting with previous Shopify devs? Was it just um, what was your aspiration there? 
No, I can't say that it was an ambition, but it was something I had in my head because when I was talking with my other freelance friends, we were always saying, so what would um, make you quit freelancing? What could it be? Mm. And so if it's a company, which company would you go work for? And my answer was always Shopify. I don't see myself quitting freelancing for another company than Shopify. Uh, so I knew that. And then when talking with uh, Clean Canvas uh, teammates, I was like, yeah, it really sounds cool. And then they just happened to contact me over email. They have like talent sourcers, uh, which I didn't know. Uh, they messaged me and they presented the role, the technical architect one. And I was like, no, this is perfect. This is too big of an opportunity. There's no way I'm saying no to that. It's too cool. Too, too cool. So what is a technical architect at Shopify? What's the role look like for you there? Um, so it's uh, in a team that I never heard about. Uh, I feel like I only knew a small part of Shopify, honestly. Um, it's uh, the professional services team. So it's basically a team that does paid services, uh, both for merchants and for agencies. And inside professional services, there's a smaller team called growth services. Uh, it's seven people. So it's six people and our lead, uh, Michael Gooding, uh, who you had on the pod uh, a few weeks ago. So he's my lead, he's my manager. And uh, inside growth services, there's the four, four topics of expertise, basically. They started with the topic that you know best because you had, Michael, uh, it's performance. Uh, so they're starting doing paid audits and then implementation of the recommendation uh, made during the audit. They've done that for a bit more than a year now. And then after performance, they started a new expertise, which is CRO. Uh, so there's uh, someone on my team, Fabian, who's an expert in CRO. So he does uh, paid services in that area. And we also have uh, Diana who does uh, SEO services. And now they've opened a fourth topic, which is web development. So that's uh, where I am uh, with my colleague Juan. And so we do uh, so paid services as well. But for us, it's not audits and then implementation. Um, it's half technical consulting. So if an agency or if a merchant has questions uh, mostly about the latest Shopify features, they're not sure how to use this or they've implemented something, but uh, they need advice, basically. We do that. So technical hours, technical consulting hours, sorry. And the other part is development, so purely building. So if they need help building a feature or if they need help, um, they have developers internally and they want us to help them, uh, we jump on and to where we can to help. So it's perfect to be very much up to date with the latest features because usually they're not going to contact us for like basic store setup. It's usually very uh, big brands and for edge cases, which I love. Um, and, and yeah, learning a lot. And I don't know, it's a project that I would never have touched on if I, if I had stayed a freelance and the team is just so amazing. So yeah, great, uh, great job. Very happy about it. Sounds like a lot of variety like you would get in freelancing, which I imagine is something you enjoy. That's yeah, cool. yeah, exactly. It's in my head, I've, I thought that if I joined Shopify one day, I would, I would be a developer on one of the topics that they have. They have so many. Um, but this is even better for me because I get to, to develop, but also help like through consulting and also just keep talking to merchants, which I was afraid of losing uh, when joining a company. So yeah, it's the perfect mix for me so far. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's a good that's a good insight, Pearl. It, it kind of let's say the, the different things that you get to work with. It does sound like you still get to be a freelancer, but without all the negative parts of being a freelancer. Of you know, you're running your own business and you have to focus on you know your own business as well as helping you know support other businesses as well. You yeah. just get to focus on supporting other businesses uh, yeah. and kind of feeding more into the the Shopify ethos there. So that's really cool. That's that's awesome. That's a it sounds like an amazing role there. Yeah, it's really cool. I hope we expand the team. I hope we uh, we succeed in what we're doing. We're helping uh, agencies, merchants, and hopefully we need more people and it's going to become something even bigger. Uh, we have great ambition for the team. That's awesome. So here in the U.S., well, maybe maybe this is just me, but I feel like there's a common trope or meme, if you call it, where people would assume like, oh, man, if only I were elected president someday, then as <laughs> soon as you're in the White House, they tell you all the secrets like, yeah, okay, we have aliens. They're over here. Okay. Here's all the new secret <laughs> weapons we're working on they're over here, that kind of stuff. So now that you're in Shopify, like it's part of me that wonders like, oh, do they like give you like a file that shows all the really cool technologies <laughs> they're working on, all the APIs that we don't actually understand or have access to? Is there anything like that going on over there? Yeah, She's I love that you mentioned oh. the aliens because that would be my question number one if I was elected <laughs> president. I really want to know. <laughs> Where are the aliens? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but yeah, uh, absolutely. It's um, um, it's surprisingly surprised to me because I I didn't really project myself in the company before joining. Um, but yeah, I was surprised at how open it is. Uh, I I have information about my team, of course, but also about what other teams are doing. Uh, it's very easy to contact uh, like product manager on a product you're very interested on and say. Would you like to have a call so that I can understand uh, what you're doing? Especially when you just arrived, it's, it's also part of the onboarding to go meet people. So yeah, it's quite open. Uh, I do have more information than when I was a freelance, for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, only only allowed to communicate about uh, what's public, of course. Um, yeah, cool stuff, cool stuff. No, that's, that's exciting. Which, again, great. Yeah, you've got access, direct access to some of those folks. So again, just, oh man, you're making freelancing sound so lame right now. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I need to pivot and try to try to change up my tactics here. All right, Taylor, <laughs> no, let's have great. a resume workshop, you and I, after this. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what we need to do. We'll give Michael a call, see if... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, you already uh, have the right contact. <laughs> right, exactly. Like we've got we've got the right people to talk to. Yes. Ah, oh, man, <laughs> on a, a hidden benefit of the podcast. Had no idea that this was going to work out this well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, but you, you're kidding. But I did receive some messages on Twitter saying I didn't know this role existed. Uh, are you guys recruiting? How does it work? Um, yeah. yeah. So that's good. So we'll we'll help get the word out here at least that this you know this team does exist. And uh, if you're a freelancer looking for all the 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 good parts of freelancing and, and, and getting rid of all the bad stuff. Apparently you need to reach out to, to Michael and Coralie here, try to try to get your foot in the door. I guess. Um, well, so speaking of community, at least uh, I, I say, if we want to talk to, we were talking about a couple of different topics here as well that we could talk about before you came on. And obviously like you have tons of experience. Uh, and, and so we could go really deep kind of one way or another, but the thing that I thought was really interesting was we do we obviously have this you know Shopify developer community and uh, here in the U.S. Carl doesn't have this he's he's much more learned and cultured than I am but I have this tendency to really just focus on you know how things impact like U.S. developers I don't I don't really have a good like global or international uh, kind of con type of context for things and so I don't know if you can talk a little bit about like what the Shopify developer community is like in in France. Um, I know that's, um, I think y'all have even had some, some events relatively recently. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you see, uh, you know, Eunice is one that I see all the time, you know, posting about things and, and it sounds like y'all have some amazing talent over there, obviously as well. So I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit, or even, uh, maybe good resources for maybe other people who are listening, watching on the podcast, um, over in France or over, um, different parts of the world, you know, too, about what what it can be like for a developer community there for Shopify. Mm. Yeah, um sure. Well in France, um it's it's true that we have a I'd say we have a great community honestly uh, in France. I don't know about the UK which is also a reason why I'm very happy to have moved here is also to start uh, from scratch and discover the ecosystem here. Uh, but in France, um, basically what we have mainly in terms of events, like so far, was mainly events organized um, either by Shopify or by agencies. And so as freelancers, when I was a freelance, we would meet at these events and it was mostly in Paris. So I would see like four or five of my friends and call the ones in the South France and tell them, oh, you missed that event. It was really cool, blah, blah, blah. But we never really had an event for freelancers per se, uh, which okay. is what we've done at the end of last year. Uh, we got uh, all together in Paris. A lot of them made the trip from the South or West, East. It was really, really cool. It was, I think, uh, 20, 25 of us, uh, which was nice. Wow. And we tried to keep group. the yeah. tradition going now, have uh, more meetups. We have one next month, actually, uh, for freelancers again. And this time it's a, it's a Shopify partner organizing it. Uh, it's it's Payplug, it's a payment company. So they're gathering all freelancers. So it's going to be a good opportunity to meet. Um, and on the side of that, we see more and more like initiatives to like kind of get an Airbnb for a few days and go work all together. It's, uh, I see that more and more, uh, in France, which is really cool. There's going to be something organized in June as well. That's going to be, uh, around that. It should be in Portugal. So that would be cool. It's not me organi oh, nice. organizing. It's just, uh, friends, but yeah, basically, when you start in the freelance uh, ecosystem in France, you have those events. Uh, you have also, of course, uh, the Discord that UNES created, uh, which is very active uh, to learn and like ask any questions that you have, basically. Um, 
And then for the events organized by Shopify, um, sometimes it's also just e-commerce events in general and just Shopify happens to be there. Like for example, the Paris Retail Week that is in September every year. This is kind of a big deal. So we also go uh, to that. And then each agency has their events where they gather like former clients that they had and make them uh, speak about their challenges and stuff like that. So it's very, very active ecosystem. I think that we communicate a lot like on social media, so it makes us appear big. Uh, I don't think France is that big of a market, like, I don't know, compared to others. I, I would say that we're smaller, for example, than Germany, but I don't see uh, that uh, many events in Germany so far. I don't know. I think I only see France because like, I'm in a bubble, uh, like on Twitter and stuff. But it is very active. Uh, so far yeah yeah it sounds very and that's really interesting it sounds like there's a lot of agencies hosting hosting yeah. events specifically which i don't know i don't think carl i don't know if you've you've seen that as much i think we had talked about it a little bit trying to have some kind of in-person event and there are some agencies that are based or you know large app providers that are based out of like columbus like where we are in ohio and stuff um, yeah. but i don't i don't really see a whole lot of that so maybe it's actually might be beneficial that it's a smaller community because like maybe they're a little bit more active with some of those um community based or outreach um kind of type programs so i think that's awesome yeah. it's quite surprising for people coming from outside the ecosystem like from other platforms sometimes uh mm -hmm. because the the ambience is really nice like when you go to an event with only shopify agencies they don't really look like competitors like they're all friends yeah. and they all know each other it's uh it's really nice to see and for freelancers it's quite the same there's a lot of uh, uh of sharing information uh, advice mm -hmm. and helping the new ones so yeah really like uh that vibe going on yeah that's been a consistent thing i think in the shopify community in general yeah. is it doesn't feel like i and i expected that i don't know if if um if you all had this too, when you started freelancing, I had this kind of concept of business being very cutthroat, you know, and my, my former life, I was a social worker. So that was all the time I spent was like social services with, with people and different things like that. And so my, my, um, you know, my thoughts about businesses were it's just, it's very competitive. Um, but in, in the Shopify community, at least, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of the same, like, it's just more about people being very friendly, um, and it is, yeah, other people from, you know, the Magento community who've now mm. moved over or something like that to Shopify, they're all just, they're old pals. And so they're all just trying to help, you know, share and um, promote each other. So that's, that's really cool to hear that it's also the same thing happening over there too. Yeah. There's also so many topics to specialize on. So like mm -hmm. you're going to have agencies who are more into migration or some are going to offer just one services, which will be like CRO optimization, for example. So there's really space for everyone, uh, which also helps, I think. Mm -hmm. You have to excuse my ignorance here, Corley, but something I've, I've always wondered about is I recognize being an American, you know, a lot of, you know, the initial development, at least commercialization around the internet seems to have come from American companies, not exclusively, but a lot of it, it just happens to be, it's all in English, right? A lot of our development languages are in English, all the documentation is English. So being someone who's not a first native speaker of English, like, do you find that to be a big challenge as a developer? Or am I just ignorant and there's actually a lot of translation happening that I just don't ever see because I'm not looking for it? Does that make sense? When you, when you learn development? Yeah, like, you know, I even take for, for granted, for example, if you're learning Ruby, which uh, obviously everybody should, uh, you know, all yeah. of the... <laughs> All the methods and the key functions, everything, it's all English, uh, even though it was developed yeah. by someone from Japan. So it's it's like, you know, we take for granted how easy it is, but how big of a challenge has that been as someone learning development? What's that like in the community in France to have to deal with the English-centric nature of it? Um, well, for, from my experience, it's something we were told from day one at Le Wagon, uh, the coding bootcamp there said, uh, like they're used to English because all of the documentation will be in English. Probably all the tutorials that you will find will be in English as well. And at the time, also Stack Overflow, which maybe we'll use less these days. Right. But yeah, they were saying all the answers that you'll see will be in English. So half of the training I got was in English. Like um, mm -hmm. the lesson they would have in the morning were taught in, in French, but like the slides will be in English and everything. So um, yeah, because it was part of the training, I was kind of used to it. And also, um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. English was always my favorite topic, so I it I wasn't really bothered. But if you don't like English or it like you didn't, for example, if your um, 
transitioning from another field, which you didn't have really to use English for, then maybe it can be a bit hard at the beginning. But I think there's so many like advantages in learning to code and see how kind of powerful it makes you like to be autonomous and create your own project that I think we just, it, it's okay. Like, I don't think we mind uh, learning English for that. Like, it's so rewarding that I think it's fine. I'm speaking only for me and people I see around me, but I don't know if I can, if I can really generalize. That's really interesting. Yeah. Again, I just think I take it for granted that as hard as yeah. programming is, at least it's easiest as it could be because yeah, anyway, so thank you for sharing your perspective on yeah, it. We're not having to learn, you know, in addition to learning the programming language itself, not having to learn yeah. the context yeah. behind the English language that it might be leaning towards. So yeah, that's, that's true. It's kind of an advantage if like you're a native English speaker, you know, in that regard, but, um, you know, also positive, like you have that, um, that muscle to flex that you are you know, bilingual too. You're kind of like used to learning like languages and having to translate things. So your, your concept of syntax is something that you pick up probably pretty quick too. Yeah. But I think also development is a good foot in the door. If you didn't really mind like English, you, you left it on the side so far and then uh, maybe development is going to make you like it, you know? I don't know. Uh, well, I think at go. first you, you only speak the English of development. And then that's uh -huh. enough for you. And then maybe it gives you, uh, you know, motivation to learn more, hopefully. No. Mm -hmm. Hope yeah. so. well, speaking of learning more, I think this would be a good segue. I think we both love to dive into checkout extensions and functions. Yeah, they're so Tell fun. Tell us everything. Tell us everything. Oh, um, honestly, I'm going to say the real truth. Um, I saw when Shopify functions were released, I was like, okay, that sounds cool, but I don't really have any um, application for it uh, whilst working with the brands I was working with. Uh, they were all on the on the old checkout. Uh, we, we had other priorities, basically. So I had them in the back of my head, but never used them. And then recently uh, I was on YouTube and I, it was, I think, uh, yeah, I had already joined Shopify and I was on YouTube and I was, okay, let me find if there is a Shopify function tutorial just so that I have a, an easy way to start, basically. Sometimes I prefer to have a tutorial where someone speaks to me and then I go in the docs. Like sometimes mm -hmm. the docs straight away seems a bit uh, rough for me. Uh, so I found a tutorial from Jan, uh, Jan Frey, from Coding with Jan channel. So I watched that. And then afterwards, I watched a tutorial from Younes on his uh, channel, uh, Odestry, uh, where he was showing how to build a card validation uh, extension with a Shopify function. It was, I think, an hour tutorial. Like, it was very long. He took some time uh, to put it together. So I watched that. Thanks. And then I was like, okay, now I understand the purpose. So I'm going to go in the doc, and then I'm going to try to build my first one and hopefully a second one. And so that's what I did. But the tutorial that I watched from Younes, it's like eight months old. I just, uh, yeah, I got into it just now uh, and seeing the mm -hmm. potential now but yeah I, i'm a bit late to the game i think well like like a freelancer and or uh you know a professional freelancer working for shopify at this point you know you're you you kind of just have to wait until you have a good use case for some of this yeah. stuff because realistically exactly. i mean there's just there's not enough time in the day to try to stay up to date on everything shopify right now right like it's just covering so much ground and so you know yeah like it, if you don't have a good use case, even in your spare time, yeah, uh, you know you're you're not going to be able to find it. So nice though that you finally had a use case and able to dig in and find some resources for it. Yeah, exactly. And then I check the doc, and sometimes, like for the Shopify function, for example, they're going to show you just the beginning, and so the function works, but you can add more. So I did the one from the documentation, and then I added localization. I added the logic uh, to check if the customer is logged in. It, it's useful to have this first use case, and then you build on top of it. And so, yeah, now I've, I think I've, I don't know, created, yeah, four or five this week because I got really into it. Um, but nice. it's, I only uh, saw two GitHub repos, though, so... <laughs> You know, you should that's... see more in the upcoming days if I <laughs> well, <laughs> good. them out in the wild. Teach yeah. me how to work with functions, Coralie. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> that's so I'm oh, no, it's really good. Expose my ignorance yet again and ask you a question, Coralie. So when I work with functions, one of the struggles I have is when you're writing your initial GraphQL query for the, the run dot GraphQL. Um you know, obviously you can use the GraphQL app in the in the store, but I you can't run those queries in the GraphQL app. At least I haven't uh, been able to say so. Um, the query that you have in the run.graphql uh, mm -hmm. file? Right. 
can you run those in the GraphQL app? Because I always it always gives me errors about the objects I'm referencing and stuff. And that works um, for you guys. Yeah, what I do the GraphQL app, I don't use it that much. I used it for um, to get the first part of the run dot GraphQL, which was get the shop and the meta field on the shop. So this mm -hmm. works in the GraphQL app. I don't know what you tried uh, specifically. The cart, I think. I think um, usually you have yeah. to make sure to, and this has got me many times with it, that you're using the right API. I think that's a really easy thing to miss. Like I was doing this for a long time with the storefront um, API and I needed something from the from the admin, right? And I don't. I was sending screenshots and, and talking to somebody on, on Twitter about this and they were like, yeah, you're just using the wrong API. So <laughs> I was like, oh, it's just this little drop down. I need to make sure I'm using the right one. So whoops, huh, I'm sure you don't make mistakes like that, Carl, but you know, no. for someone like me, no. you know, that's, I would recommend if someone's running into that, make sure you're using the right API. Well, I'm going to try it again because I swear that, you know, my conclusion I came to is this isn't working. The reason it isn't working is because there don't, the, the don't, there seems to be different GraphQL objects that I'm using on the function side versus the admin API. And I just yeah. concluded that there must be a difference and I couldn't quite figure out how to test those queries. So, yeah, I know that for the card validation app, uh, there was a list of objects that I could use and only those ones. So there was the shop, the localization one, and uh, the customer one, which is called buyer identity, I think. Uh, but there was not much more than that. So if you try getting something that wasn't listed, uh, that wouldn't work. But also I did a, I had a mistake for me, which was really silly. It was just, I was trying to get the current language uh, of the session. And like in the GraphQL uh, query, I arrived at language and I thought I was done, but it wasn't done. Like inside language is like this little thing called ISO code. So you have to go really at the end, like the last node uh, for it to work. So sometimes it's just silly things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's for me. It's, it feels like uh, with when I'm trying to like work with GraphQL, it's it's trying to just keep throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks with my query. <laughs> and yeah, to keep going deeper <laughs> and deeper until I finally get what I want. But I yeah. think now too with the CLI, uh, wasn't there re relatively recently an integration where you can run with your own apps um, authentication too, like the GraphQL app? Um, am I making that up too? I don't know if y'all have experimented with that at all. I have not. I just use the GraphQL app in the shop. Um, but I think that there's a way for you to do that directly from the CLI. I'm just, I'm not familiar with that process. Yeah, I think I saw something like that on Twitter. I haven't used it. Uh, what I use is the GraphQL uh, VS Code extension. So inside mm -hmm. VS Code, I already have uh, all red, uh, if it's not correct, which helps. And then I take it to the GraphQL app to see like the result and stuff. There you go. Pro tip right there. Yeah, it's yelling at me all the time, that extension. It's very useful. <laughs> all the time. Yes, <laughs> I need it. <laughs> Speaking of the GraphQL app, maybe you know the answer to this, probably. This, uh, now we're getting off the weeds here a little bit, but I was recently working with a store. I had an extension that I wrote, and I wanted them to run some queries manually outside the extension for some of the checkout branding stuff. And uh, they couldn't run them because they didn't have the right scopes with the GraphQL app. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, I'm looking, like, whoever installed this previous to me didn't have those scopes available, so they didn't select them. I couldn't see a way to change them on the fly. So I'm like, well, I think the only thing you have to do is you have to uninstall the GraphQL app, reinstall it, and then select the right scopes. Not a big deal. But they were concerned because they had multiple developers working, and they didn't want them to lose access to their, their queries that kind of save for you. So I did an experiment. I said, okay, well, what happened if I have queries, and I uninstall the app and reinstall it? Will they disappear? Will they stick around? Whatever. Turns out they stick around, and not only that, but they seem to stick around regardless of what store you're on. So I don't know if they're tied to my Shopify partner account or how that works, but maybe you know, since you have access. No. <laughs> no. no I and don't. you could just ask somebody. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I, I don't use the app that much. And I see, I didn't know. Um, I didn't uh, know that. So that's, yeah, that's my sorry. experience so far too. And my assumption is that it's tied to your partner ID. Um, your Which partner account sense. somehow. Because yeah, yeah. If, if I pull it up on a different shop, I still have like queries that I've run elsewhere. So obviously mm. from that perspective, you would obviously want to make sure you're cautious there and how you're yeah. perceived. I would have expected it to have been scoped to the store somehow, but I yeah, was like, oh, I, would have thought that too. <laughs> this I was confused when I saw that before as yeah. well. So, but you know, what? I'll, I'll be I'll a real developer and I'll use the VS code thing that Coralie. So I'll stop messing with that. Yeah, that's what I do, but no, it's interesting also what you're saying. I'll try it out to see uh, how it's scoped. Nice one. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully not a not a bug that you've just uncovered, huh? <laughs> so is, you're fine. in the performance you're on the performance team. 
one of the things about functions that always got me too, when they first came out, it was all Rust. That was the only option. I was like, I'm not learning Rust. Try to shop apply function and no interest. Um, not Rust. And now that JavaScript is available, obviously most people are probably reaching for that. But being on the performance team, I imagine one of the use cases for having Rust in the first place is the performance. It's got to be better than JavaScript. So are you in a spot where they're going to expect you to to learn Rust and use it? Do you see any reason or any advantage to go down that road for most folks at this point? No, I don't think that's something uh, that is going to be asked uh, for me. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not per se on the performance team. Like I'm on the right. growth services the team with the services. with the performance folks, uh, but they know like way more than me. That's really their specialty. Like Mateus and Sia, who write the the articles uh, on the blog, are really experts uh, about that. Um, I think we do have some questions sometimes about the Shopify functions, but because there's a limit in the documentation of like uh, the size of your Shopify function, uh, actually, mm -hmm. if it's live on your store, then it's already like performant enough uh, from Shopify point of view. So mm -hmm. we never had a demand which was help us optimize our Shopify function. Uh, that doesn't happen. It's most of the time it's about the store itself and and the theme. Mm -hmm. No. I do write so, them in JavaScript. My Shopify function. I don't use Rust. Uh, yeah. I've never, no I've Rust never here. tried. <laughs> no, no. Coralie Rust is also not learning Rust. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> tell tell Sammy uh, that I say I use just fine because I think he did that for Discount Kit. Um, oh, okay. We had him on a little while ago, but he was he was talking up Rust. So nice, good yeah. for him. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have anything else Shopify function wise you want to pass on, or should we dive into checkout extensions a little bit? Um, no, just. About Shopify function, I don't know if you had the same wow moments uh, as me, but for me it was um, when I tried to, um, I used the, Graph, the GraphQL uh, app actually that day and really see the error that you um, add in your function when you see it being written by the server, like, this this uh, made me really understand why they were here. Like, no more playing in the front end. Be like, if this or this, just display this error, and then you can hack that to the URL or something else. Like now, it's really the the, the server answering no to you wherever from wherever you attack it. Like, uh, if it's in on the product page or the cart page. Uh, for my cart validation app, for example, I could like try to add more than two from any page on the website and I still get the error. So this was the wow moment for me and that's really when I understood uh, how useful they were. Yeah, they're way more robust than any kind of theme logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, we can talk about uh, check out your extension if you wish. No. Sure, and just one last plug, you know, given our shared background, see what you can do to get them to support Ruby as a language for <laughs> Shopify functions. I think that that's the right way to go personally. <laughs> So I'm guessing you were sad when the Shopify scripts were deprecated. Yeah, that was kind of okay. like my favorite part. Was uh, I see. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> Say lovey, <you>, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so check out extensions. Let's check those out. So what are you um, playing around with those right now? You said you've been building a couple. What yeah, kind of stuff you I have. Into? Um, I actually started with the example in the documentation, which was the banner. Um, so that was cool. And then same, uh, because some stuff were missing from the basic example, I tried to add uh, on top of it. And for example, for the banner, it works well, um, with a store that is only in one language. So for example, only in English, then you're going to add settings so that the merchant can add the banner title, the banner subtitle, banner description and stuff. But then when you have multiple languages, then how does this get translated? Uh, it doesn't. So that's what I tried to do. And so in that case, when you have multiple languages, what I set up was that um, the merchant is not going to add his content to the settings. I removed them uh, from the setting. And the, he is going to add the information from a meta field on the shop level. And in this meta field, which is a JSON, he's going to be able to put his French uh, banner title, French banner description, and then his English, Spanish, whatever. Um, and then in the checkout UI extension, I get the current language of the of the store, and then I display like the right translation. So 
That's something that wasn't in the doc. So that was a question I had when I was finished building the banner. So I added it. It's on the repo um, as well. So I've been playing with that uh, localization. And I also, um, after the banner, I've started building a product upsell extension just to see how it's done. And so that's my current project at the moment. Um, because for some clients that I had in the past, we used uh, apps like Checkout Blocks, uh, which is really great. Um, and it, it's really great for the for the merchant because I was able to put something uh, that they needed like really fast. But for me, I still have a question about how did Gil uh, build this? Like, I want to see how it built like mm -hmm. under the hood. So that's why I'm building it now and see if I can understand uh, how it's done basically. And I'm learning a lot. Uh, each extension is a is yeah a new a new field to discover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's there's just so much you could do with checkout extensions. I think that's yeah. really interesting. You know, and, and I do, I mean, initially it's kind of sad, right? Like, so we moved from checkout.liquid and things being relatively simple because uh, JavaScript at the end of the day. Yeah, yes, uh oh. Um, so as far as uh, that goes, you know, like we went from simple JavaScript kind of type changes to, okay, now like we've got to spin up this whole, whole app essentially. Right. Um, so the nice thing is at least as a, as a front end dev on, on my side of things, you know, um, with the extensions only route, you know, if we don't have to worry still about like hosting and everything else, cause it's just, it's just all Shopify from that perspective. Right. And so that is though nice when you get to that point where it is like relatively standard. So it's a little bit more limited, but it is nice that, uh, there's, there's a path forward, at least for most of the things that we want to do there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I don't know if you've played around. That's something I use to know what's possible with Checkout Your Extension. I use um, Gil's Playground that he built for Checkout Blocks, which is basically a, Ooh, a nice. page. You don't have to yeah. log in or anything or even have a Shopify store. You just go and you can uh, tick different extensions to have them be added like um, live on the page. And so it's very useful for me to see what's possible because I know that Gil is very up to date with uh, the latest APIs and the latest capabilities. So learning a lot from uh, his work uh, to see what's possible. Yeah, for sure. I remember seeing him post about that, but I haven't actually played mm. around with it. I'll have to spend a little bit of time on that. Cause yeah. like, yeah, his, he's just, <laughs> his, his app is obviously super fantastic. And, and that is the recommendation when I'm talking to people like, you know, you, we can go with this app. Like it does everything, mm. like anything yeah. that's possible, check out extensions and this is the app that you want. Um, but as far as, you know, when you have small use cases for people who just want something simple, you know, like the banners um, mm. or different things like that, that we used to do, you know, that kind of type stuff. I had one merchant that wanted to um, just add the ability to update or add the order note. Uh, mm -hmm. at the checkout page so that way people knew so just adding stuff like that that's relatively simple to do but yeah, yeah if you need anything complicated or a lot of a lot of things moved over yeah check out boxes for sure an awesome option so i'll check out on the check out the playground we'll we'll throw that in the mm. show notes afterwards too yeah really cool it's like for me i use it if if i want to discover um uh, like if it's a developer asking i often just show the documentation but if it's a merchant or like a friend or um developer who's starting out the playground is perfect because like in two seconds you understand everything you can do mm -hmm. yeah and, and gil's put a ton of time effort and energy i think I mean, he was yeah. like one of the original people that they brought on to talk about checkout blocks i think when they first started talking about them right yeah i, I feel like that was like years ago at this point i can't remember what event it was one of the online was it called unite when it was online too I can't remember. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They yeah. started, they announced like checkout extensions and what it was going to look like. And I think it was Gil talking about it and like how it worked and stuff. So he's, yeah. he's been working with merchants for these checkout extensions for so long. I think that was one of the reasons why they tapped him for, for this. Cause he kind of had it figured out really well and check out that liquid. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's really his expertise and I find him so inspiring. Like I know that a few days ago on Twitter, he shared uh, a screenshot of an email he received and the email was, uh, hi Gil, you now have access to the beta of uh, the different checkout APIs. And he said like, thank you. Uh, I don't remember the name of the person. Thank you X uh, for saving my life. Or, like starting this wonderful journey for me. I don't remember the sentence, but yeah, he, he was one of the first one to have access and he's made something amazing out of it. It's impressive. Yeah, for sure. We got to trick him into coming on sometime. I know. <laughs> I'll keep asking him. Yeah. 
Um, so one of the things about checkout extensions that I'm still just getting into, I'm curious what your guys' approach has been. You alluded to it a moment ago, Carly, in terms of when you have a checkout extension that requires some sort of setting that ideally the merchant would be able to control on their own. I think there's a technology for this, but how have you guys typically approached that? You talked about setting a meta object on the shop, but in terms of the merchant actually interacting with it through an interface or through whatnot, what do you do for that? Uh, either through the settings when there's just one language, so they're used to it because it looks a lot like the theme customizer. It's, it's the same uh, interface. And if it's more complex than that, I use MetaField. But I don't know if my clients are very representative uh, of, of merchants in general, but I know that the type of clients I was working with, they were not afraid of JSON at all. Like they really liked it. So I could put uh, JSON MetaField for them and they would just go and replace the strings and stuff. But I don't know if you can do that for smaller merchants who maybe they they could be a bit scared of that. Uh, I had a question the other day on LinkedIn, what do you do for non-technical merchants? And yeah, in that case, it would be more classic MetaField, I guess, just text or just a number to write and no JSON. Um, it also removes the risk of errors because if you break it with just a uh, comma missing or something, yeah, that could be quite bad. But yeah, so far I've been using JSON uh, with my clients before Shopify. Nice, yeah. What did I'm, you do, I'm Taylor? Saying, I think, I th no, I, say I don't do that. Uh, my clients are like, nope. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> usually I can't get them to change stuff in the in the regular theme customizer. Can't so, go to their house. You know, trying to... <laughs> trying to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm striving over. No, so that that is so what Carl alluded to. That's that's what I've done. I've I've actually used a combination of the checkout settings in conjunction with a, a meta object. So, mm -hmm. for instance, I've done this with a couple for um, either upsells or uh, in another instance where we we had to do something um, specific. Um, I'm trying to remember what that use case was at the moment or why we chose to go that route, but basically. Um, let them call out the type in the handle for the meta object that they want. And so that way the merchant can then set and put in order because it will respect the order too of like products. So like if you wanted to loop through and say like, okay, upsell this product, upsell this product um, kind of type thing. So it was, it's kind of like an extension of the upsell tutorial that was on uh, the Shopify docs there, uh, okay. but just changing it. So that way the products that I'm pulling in, are from uh, the meta object that gets set. So it'll also pull in all the text and everything else and what have you. So that's that's the way that I've gone with that. Uh, so interesting interesting thought about instead of like maybe shifting to like meta fields that are set on the shop. Um, Cause I don't, I don't know if that would be easier or not. If I could get, if I could teach my merchants to use uh, JSON, I think that would probably be the easiest thing, but that's, that's been my, my go-to has been, uh, you know, all they gotta do is copy and paste the type of meta object in the handle. And then it pulls all the config in from there. Um, mm. but that's uh so that's that's an interesting interesting option maybe i can start doing some mini mini tutorials for my merchants for how to use json and then that would make my life easier i don't have to keep setting up all these meta objects <laughs> yeah it is easier it's 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 true that it's a lucky place than if you work with them because sometimes they would contact me and they would say so this is broken but i think it's because i did that and this and this and they just they made the diagnostic. I have nothing else to do. They just fix what they said because yep. they they know, I know where right the away is. what yeah, was wrong. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh -huh. And they go like in their Shopify admin and for example, on one product, uh, when they're on the product page, they add the .json at the end of the URL and like they look at how the API is built and they love it. So it's quite fun to work with them for that. That's awesome. Yeah, I, that's and I think that's great when you have, if you are working with a, an established shop that already has like a technical lead of some sort typically. And then you're just kind of like the, you're the console, you know, you're the, you're the consultant more so like in that instance where you're like, okay, like here's how we get this done. Um, a lot of times, and, and this might be the case, you're in my instances, I'm working either directly with the brand owner or I'm working with like a marketing or SEO um, director who's like the lead. Um, and so usually for them, you know, my eyes glaze over if they start talking about, you know, all these different ad metrics that they're tracking and different things like that. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but then from their perspective too, they don't want to touch anything code yeah. or theme related at all. So, um, so yeah, it's, it probably just all depends on the kind of clients that you have and how you change your tactics in order to make that work. Yeah, for sure. So for the sake of our listeners and excuse my ignorance once again, but I have not successfully done anything with settings where the user can interact with it through the interface. I've done a meta field on a shop, 
But mm. when you say they can do it through the store settings and edit the meta field, like how do you actually, how does that work for the merchant's perspective in the store through the admin page? Um, for what? For the for the banner, for example. Yeah, for any any of the different techniques we've talked about for passing settings into an extension from the merchant's perspective, either mm. uh, JSON, like you're saying, or setting a meta field. Like, how does that actually work in the UI for a merchant? That's where I'm still a little stuck. Oh, uh, so for the banner, if we keep the example, uh, if they go in their theme customizer and then in the drop down of pages they go to checkout, uh, they'll be able to see uh, like the the app block of the banner, so yeah. they can add it wherever they want uh, on on the checkout page. Well, actually, wherever the developer said they could. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, it was on the information page, so they could uh, put it wherever they want on that page. And so the settings they have access here in the theme customizer is the um, um, is the banner collapsible or not. So do we see the description straight away, or do we have to click uh, to expand and see it? Uh, they can they can also choose uh, the status of the banner. So if it's success, warning, critical, or information that they can do that in the checkout editor. And then if they want to change the text of the banner for the French market, the English, the Spanish, then they have to go to um, a shop level meta field. And those are not available natively. Uh, you can't go to settings and then custom data to edit that because it's not available. Um, the shop site didn't make it available yet. So you have to install an app for that. Usually I use Metafield Guru, uh, which is free, but you can use uh, any other app. So in that case, you would go inside Metafield Guru. You would see um, the different models where you can add Metafields to, product collection or the shop. So you would click on shop. And here you would see the Metafield they have created, which is a JSON. And so you would uh, change the, um, the text of the banner, title, description in different languages. That's how it would work. Okay, that's really helpful. Thanks for walking me through it. Because I'm thinking, I swear I can't figure out how to change these meta fields, but they seem to be talking like there's a <laughs> way to do it. So, all right, that's good to know. Because some of the tutorials, if you look at them on the Shopify site, like they walk you through actually building out a merchant facing UI in the checkout extension as an app. Uh, yeah. But then that's a whole nother level of you know work to do. So, it's good to know. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's, yeah. that's an important distinction, right? If you're wanting to. If you're setting something like a meta field on like an object like the shop, right? Like you pretty much need the app because I don't think there is a way natively uh, to set a meta field on the shop. You have to use an app no, at the moment, at least for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know I if it's coming. <laughs> GraphQL directly. I mean, that's how I've been doing it, but that's nice to know. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, for a merchant to to update. Yeah, that's a good point. GraphQL or or yeah, that way. Yeah. The simpler way if, is the, if they only have one language, then they do all of the changes in the checkout editor, the text included. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, depends on your use case. And yeah, I wonder why they... the... Sorry, go, go ahead. Taylor. No, no, you're fine. Um, no, I was saying th this is how I chose to do it, but maybe there's there's a better way. It's also why I share the repo is because uh, I'm mm -hmm. open to people coming and say, oh, you set it up this way, but I found this better way. Here is how I did it. So yeah, I, this is how I've done, but I'm not saying it's the, it's the absolute best way. Maybe there's a yeah. better way. And I think that's why I ended up opting for uh, meta objects over, you know, like a meta field based on the shop because I can still yeah. get that in GraphQL. Um, so that might be might be something to look at as far as that mm. goes. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll open up a, a PR or something. But so but I'm I'm really surprised that Shopify we've got all these other objects available to set meta fields on in custom data. But why it's curious that we don't have that on the shop. I wonder if they're just worried about stuff breaking there. <laughs> or I'm not I'm not really sure. Is is there something special about shop like in these apps that they're doing to prevent? Is there some someone kind of you issue? could slack right now, Coralie, that could get us that answer? <laughs> Get them on the it line. Might be, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't the have the answer, channel. honestly. Uh, Jesse uh, McGinnis, right? <laughs> that's um, that's. Wait, we need to ask him. What's what's the deal? Yeah. Why can't we get shop in the admin here? So, yep. I'd be interested. I, I'm I'm not sure. I, I, shop might be the object where there's less use case. You know, less use yeah, cases. Yeah, for sure. It's like the less mm -hmm. common. So maybe that was not a priority. But I don't know. Hopefully, it's coming in the future. I, I could see maybe the concern for if they made it accessible that people just stuff it in everything, like yeah, everything <laughs> into shop. So and kudos to Metafield's Guru for being around for like forever and being a good option for that. So yeah, they're uh, they're in a ton of shops. So yeah, it's been years. Like I was using them before Metafield were native. They were my yep. go-to apps, and yeah, yep. they've. I don't know. I don't want to say a mistake, but I think they've been around since like 2015 or something. It's Probably. quite old.
18 mm -hmm. or 17, I don't know. But yeah, great yeah, app. Because people don't realize how long Metafields were around until like they stuck them in the admin, you know, kind of yeah. type thing. And it's like, no, Metafields yeah. have been around for a very long time. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty cool. They have. And now it becomes even more interesting with Shopify apps using meta objects for their databases, uh, yep. which I haven't done yet, but I've seen more and more app developers on Twitter sharing that. So they kind of put the responsibility on Shopify to handle that and they sleep better, which, which is yep. great. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, we've talked to a handful of folks. We need, we do need, we need to have you back on when you get it figured out, because we we need to have somebody on the podcast that can walk us through like a just a basic example of that. Because I've seen that talked about quite a bit from the app dev side. I'd I'd love to see a real, actual working like repo um, kind of type thing out of that. Yeah. So not that I'm I know enough huge into app which dev, does but that, yeah, but not a repo. Oh yeah, well checkout blocks does it. That's so Gil Gil does that with checkout blocks. That's all yeah. he's doing is is meta fields um, and stuff. So uh, there's a handful of apps that are leveraging meta fields and meta objects really, really well. Um, so yeah, we'll have to find somebody that's willing to come on and kind of open the open the door on that a bit for us. Pull back yeah. the curtain. I don't know what the word is, the term. So and speaking of being around for a long time, uh, we've also been going for a long time now, so we should probably land the plane, so to speak, as much as I'd like to talk about this for forever. But um any last thoughts or words around checkout extensions before we transition to our community stuff, change log and pick of the week? No, I'm good. No. Okay. Sabian. So <laughs> Taylor. I, I took that. I took French for three years in high school. So Coralie, I'm sitting here this entire tell. time trying to come up with one phrase <laughs> like <laughs> <a> piece together. <laughs> Uh, really cool. Thanks. Taylor, what you got for us? Well, we'll keep it uh, short and sweet. We did we actually had week. a couple of listener submitted questions. Um Sorry, and, and we talked about we talked about this already, the, the new role. So um Jan had submitted a question asking like, you know, talking about the new role. I feel like we talked about that pretty extensively. And and we've touched a little bit on this, but just real quick, if you had some highlights. So Ahmed um had responded he asked about how do you learn shopify theme development in the right way so Coralie, as a as a freelancer you've also worked at a theme shop and now you're working at uh the mothership uh at shopify here uh if you had to answer this question i'm sure people ask you this question all the time mm. like if you're, you're learning shopify theme development what's the right way like what's the recommended path forward that you do for that well, I think the first step is to create a development store and see how Dawn is built. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how I started. It was debuted uh, at the time, but the idea is that the basic Shopify theme gathers um, all the best practices that Shopify wants for themes, basically. So um, I would go into Dawn and really understand how the theme is built and also go to the to the repo, which is open source, and see uh, like the comments on the different releases and PRs, and see why this change uh, in particular was introduced, why they chose web components, why they chose to reduce the number of libraries and stuff like that. So learn on done. Uh, and also, I think it's interesting to look at the documentation for theme developers for the uh, for the theme store, because uh, yes. as theme developers, we have many many requirements that we have to follow. I'm saying we because of Clean Canvas, but um, a lot of requirements that they have to follow uh, to push a theme on the theme store. And so obviously when you build for a client, you're not tied by these requirements, but it's good to know them, um, the limits, the best practices. There's also a lot of UX that comes into a theme. So it's not only learning how to build a theme from a code perspective, it's also uh, trying to create settings that are understandable by the merchant. Like maybe not give them, um, I don't know, settings to change a box shadow or stuff like that. Try to keep it uh, clean and also uh, in the right place. Because uh, sometimes you could get a lot of questions of merchant asking, where is the specific settings or like they don't see it. So that's also a part that you have to learn uh, when you're interested in team development. And then I would say um, uh, read about um, performance on the performance blog because this is all uh, like related uh, yes. If you learn about um, everything that my colleagues um, in growth services have wrote about, then you should have a solid uh, knowledge base to start your first team. That's awesome. That's a super solid roadmap. There's not a, not a whole lot of things I'd change there, so that's perfect. Um, well, thank you for that. Because yeah, I think the docs are fantastic. There's there's a lot of step throughs, and you know, just having the fact that Dawn is open source and really good thought too. Like going back and reading comments and stuff like that as well. 
Yeah. Um, well, Carl, I mean, if you didn't have any follow-ups on how to properly learn Shopify theme development, I can talk real quick about what's in the change log. Go for it, Taylor. <laughs> uh, well, just, just real quick, high-level overview. Shopify CLI is now a unified tool for app theme and development on hydrogen as well. I don't know if y'all had seen that. So 3.59.0 um, is the newest version. There's probably, I don't know. I said that, but there's probably been another update since this morning or something, but uh, it's nice to have a single tool uh, as well. So check that out. If you're not using the CLI, um, you know, start, I'm, I'm not really sure what to say other than that. Um, there are also some some updates or at least some call outs here. I thought it was really interesting. There's a new maximum value for gift cards. I didn't know if y'all had seen that. Um, I honestly did not know that there was a maximum value for gift cards. I wouldn't have thought of that. Uh, but the new maximum value effective uh, May 15th will be $2,000 USD. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, purchase limit for gift card products will be limited to $10,000 USD uh, as well. So I thought that was interesting. I've never seen that before or thought about there being a limit, but obviously it makes sense maybe on some bigger ticket stores where you'd need uh, something um, it's probably a fraud thing. really it's heavy. Like, What's that? It's probably a response to some sort of fraud or something like that going on where people are abusing it. Mm, yeah, potentially. So that's that's a good thought. Yeah, I, I never would have even thought about that. So obviously it's very, very smart people working on this stuff um, who actually think about these use cases. And then just a quick note, there are some uh, performance enhancements and potentially breaking changes coming to um, AppBridge. So just something that people need to be aware of that we'll link up uh, there as well. Um, you know, some fun stuff where it's having load times, but also, um, you know, it's potentially going to cause some breaking changes for people uh, utilizing that with their apps. So um, we'll link it up in the show notes, but just a quick call out. You know, hopefully people have read that by now or will have discovered it maybe by the time this episode is released. <laughs> uh, just a heads up. Sure. They broke the bridge. All right. Good to know. All right. Time for our pick of the week. Corley, have you had time to think about yours? Um, yeah, I guess. Um, can you just, is it, what, is it something that I'm looking forward to? Basically something exciting? Anything. That... Yeah, it could be something like, yeah, go ahead. I guess could um, be a long. Yeah. Um, so, well, right now I'm in London. Uh, that's where I'm, I'm based. So I'm going to be going to Paris next month and I'm going to go to a couple of events. And one of them is the wide event organized by Matt de Souza, um, famous app developers uh, in France. And so I couldn't go to the first one last year, unfortunately, but I, I am going to this one. And I think it's going to be a very interesting event. It's English speaking one, and it's going to be a few guests uh, giving talks on uh, different topics. I think he's going to have one entrepreneur, a Shopify uh, entrepreneur. He might have also app developers. I haven't uh, checked the, the up-to-date lineup, but it should be interesting. I know um, that uh, people are going to be flying in uh, to France for the event from other countries in Europe. So I'm very excited for that event and yeah, looking forward to it. That's cool. Nice. You're not speaking at it? You're just going to be attending? No. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to be attending. Okay. So my pick, I'll go next, is uh, in high school, I did take three years of French. And the reason I took three years of French is because I was thinking about, do I want French or Spanish or Latin? Okay, Spanish, French. I had two goals in mind. One was if I traveled, I was probably going to travel somewhere to Europe. That was what I was mostly interested in doing at the time. And the second thing is, you know, if I ever wanted to meet that special someone, I figured French is a language of love. Better to have that one under my belt necessarily in Spanish. So somewhere along the way, I picked up this book called Wicked French, which is a little phrase book with some French terms that you can use to, to woo that certain someone, along with some other things in there too, some travel phrases and stuff too. So if you're looking for a guy, if you're going to that event in Paris, pick up this book. That gets you all you need to know to have a really good time in France. Very cool. Nice. I never heard of it. Yeah, well, you, why, why would you? You know them all. Actually, you probably look at them and say, these are not at all what we say here anymore. <laughs> uh, well, great pick. Mine, I won't, I won't be as, as awesome and on point as for y'all. Mine, mine will be a, a – my pick is going to be a television show called Alone. <laughs> So I don't I don't know if y'all have ever seen it. It's on the History Channel. Survival so. stuff, no? What's that? Yeah, survival. Is it uh -huh. survival? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a survival show. Uh, so they, you know, these folks they get dropped in. They only have a certain amount of items, and and their whole job, their goal is to just survive and outlast these other contestants to win 
a half a million dollars. And so it's uh, it's been a really interesting show. My my wife uh, watches it with me, and we found it's actually a great show for her to watch before bed because it actually helps her go to sleep. <laughs> so, I don't know if it's because of all the nature. It's like relatively calming, beautiful scenery. Um, obviously, like because they drop them into these like these gorgeous places that are practically untouched by people. Um, but they're obviously put in you know, dangerous situations with animals. They're trying to figure out how to you know survive long enough. So they're building these you know structures and uh, different things like that, and then also trying to like catch enough food to survive. It's basically they're slowly starving over the course of several weeks, kind of type thing. They're trying to outlast all this stuff. So it's it's a really interesting show, uh, and so I've been I've been caught up in it here um, for a while. But we. You know, found the first season on Netflix and then, you know, they had some on Amazon Prime, but I actually found the History Channel does have its own little um, channel or app or whatever kind of type thing. And so we've been watching it on there uh, up until this point, but great show. Uh, we're, we're hooked. Uh, so, you know, I'm not I'm not a survivalist necessarily, <laughs> sure, but um, I think it's it's really interesting. I feel like you learn a lot uh, as well. So you're hard. Very cool. Alone. Yeah, I've seen the trailer. It looked really, really nice. I have to yeah, watch it's, it. Yeah, it's intense. I will say the first season it's not very good. So don't ah. if you, if you watch it in that that first first season is not very good. We actually stopped watching the first season and skipped to the second season. Um, our first season that we saw was season nine. We went way out of order, accidentally. So that's just what was on Netflix. We didn't realize there were all these other seasons, and so we went back and started uh, from there. But yeah, seasons two through nine so far, stellar. So I nice. love how you uh, like to watch alone together. Something very poetic mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. Well, anyway. it, it is interesting because you focus so much on the survival aspect, but these people, there are some of them that just, they go home early because they miss their family or just because the, the, the impact of being alone, something we take for granted because we're surrounded by people all the time really gets to them. And they're just like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm done. Uh, so I, I found that really, really interesting too. Cool. Yeah. Wow, we've well, covered a lot of ground today. French, mm-hmm. being alone, Shopify. I think we I think we hit it all. Here's a good place to call it. So, Coralie, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, it was a you. pleasure to talk to you. Didn't even get a chance to talk about your newsletter, but if people want to find you and learn more about you, they should what? They should subscribe to your newsletter. They can find you on Twitter. Put some stuff in the show notes. Anywhere else, people should look for you. Here no, is. that's it. That's it. Okay. Well, Thank excellent. you so much for having me. It was well, a of pleasure. Course. We'll do it again sometime. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Coralie. That was great. It yeah. was cool. Thank you. Thank you. It went fast. Didn't it, though? Yeah. That's Sorry, what happens you when you fall. get a good sparkling conversation and... <laughs> Yeah, get to talk about a lot of fun, fun stuff. I don't know about y'all, but even my wife and I like work together now in, you know, Shopify type stuff, but I still, it's fun to talk to other developers, you know, Mm. with just some of the stuff. Cause I say some stuff just like, I don't, I don't care about that, you know? So (laughs) She's coding with you? No. So she does a lot of uh, stuff like related to like UX. So she does a lot of like user experience type audits. And then she's also done, I mean, she's doing a whole bunch of different things, but she actually helps me set up stores like, you know, cause it doesn't really matter from a technical perspective. Sometimes you're just trying to lay out, like lay out a store and then you figure out what sections you have to customize and stuff. And so she'll do yeah. like all of that stuff up until that point. Um, and it just lets me know, Hey, like I can't change this stuff. So calls out what sections I actually have to fix to meet a design. Um, so that part's been super helpful to have but yeah no she doesn't she's not interested at all in coding or whatever uh but she did i don't know she might get caught by the bug she had to set up an app the other day where she had to find the css selector uh to uh target a button and so she said she said i i figured this out all on my own she was like i'm pretty much a hacker now and i was like okay like don't (laughs) you you need to I say you're getting the bug here. Like you're, you got a little piece of it, you know, a little taste of it. So I think maybe eventually I'll get her coding here soon. That's nice. so nice. So nice. Couples that code together stay together, Taylor. And watch alone together, apparently. Yeah. Apparently. My wife's not at all on the computers. And sometimes I think that'd be fun. But then sometimes I think it's nice that we kind of have our lanes. We don't have to like. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Anyway. 
Cool. So Corley, are you like, is this your work day? Do you get to take time out of Shopify work to do this? Or did you sneak us in through lunch or something? Like, what's going on? No, no, no. That's actually a day off. Um, oh. I took Wednesday off. It was my first day off. And today's my second one. So just chilling. <laughs> oh, you oh. took your day off to be on our podcast. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, Sick. it's a... Uh, I don't. The weather's not so great today, so I'm not gonna have big programs outside. But yeah, just chilling, and also because I just moved into a new place, I have a few things uh, to to put together, uh, like furniture and stuff. So I'll be oh, doing nice. that today. Oh, Good that's you. exciting. Well, tell tell Michael you can log a couple extra hours today because you talked up the team so much. You know? like, <laughs> that was that was work, right? You know, we'll <laughs> we'll sign off on it. <laughs> I cool. agree. I, I had fun when placing the desk like this morning because this is my like good wall, but like all around here in front of me, it's incredible mess. <laughs> oh. Well, you're just moving in. That 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 happens. You know, mm. for me, like every time we've moved, we've just had boxes for months. You know? Yeah. Just it takes me forever to unpack. That's why I hate Same. moving so much. Like once it's finally done, I'm like, I'm not moving again for another ten years. You know. <laughs> yep. I understand. Well, you said you're now away, Carl. Yeah, you in Ohio too, very close. Okay. Yeah, I live in the center of Ohio. He lives more to the north center. Okay, mm -hmm. really yeah. cool. And are you guys going to be at the Edition Dev event uh, at the end of June? I will be. I tried to talk Carl into going, and I actually he got said he wasn't going to make time for me. So, oh, good. <laughs> it's expensive, man. I don't know. Like last time, it I is. went to Unite 2019 in Toronto, and it was like 600 oh, bucks right. for the plane fare. Um, and it's like I'm a driving. one hour plane ride from here. It's just ridiculous. I could have drove driven there, but you driving? Taylor? Yeah. I'm going to take the you kids. Are? We're going to stop at, uh, we're going to drive up and stop off at Niagara Falls on the way. I know a couple um, of other developers that live in, in that area. And so going to hopefully like meet up with them for lunch and stuff and then go the rest of the way. So, are you going so to Corley? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, yes. it's part of the job. We have a uh, meeting. Summit, Shopify the day before. Summit or whatever it's yeah, called. Yeah, exactly. Safe. They, they kind of coordinated to where they've got all these people already there for Shopify. And so yeah. they're just like, oh, like we're going to pull you guys to like do a couple. Of... Are you doing any workshops? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, but Liam is preparing all the workshops and I think he's going to, yeah, have a great program ready for us. Yeah, I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be great. Now yeah. I'm really jealous. Okay, I'll think about it harder. <laughs> but it's hard for one day to travel up there. Yeah. But... Think about it, Carl. I had to apply. I'm waiting for my passport still. So, all right, I gotta check that out too. Okay, yeah. well, we should wrap this up, but uh, yeah, hopefully. So, thanks, Coralie. Yeah, I hope you get your furniture put together. Yes, if it's IKEA, you. we'll see you in a few days. <laughs> if not, <laughs> it is. So I'll see you in a few days. <laughs> so, it's not so bad. Thanks so much cool. both for your time. It was really yeah. cool. Absolutely, good to see you, Have fun. Congratulations. Have a nice rest of your day. A tooth of there, right? How, how do you say it without butchering it? And and how on, in French? Uh, yeah, a tooth of there. My pronunciation is uh, terrible. Yeah. A tooth of there. Okay. Ah, see you. <laughs> see you guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>